Janelle Riley. I'm your host for today's Half Hour with Tick, Tick, Boom. I am so pleased to welcome the film's editors. Please welcome Myron Kirstein, ACE, and Andrew Weisblum, ACE. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Now, before we get started, I always like um, if the guests can give us a quick overview of the film in your own words, sort of the, I guess, the 25 second elevator pitch. Tick, Tick, Boom is a, is the uh, origin story, if you will, of Jonathan Larson, who uh, uh, created uh, Rent in the early 90s and about his uh, struggles with trying to become um, a theatrical, musical theater star, I suppose. It's pretty good. Myron, you want to add anything or? Yeah, to some degree, it's just um, the story of an artist, any artist, you know, trying to find their voice. And um, and Jonathan Larson is finding his voice in his late 20s and uh, at a specific point of time in New York where, you know, theater is struggling and he's struggling. And, um, you know, hopefully the audience will understand what it's like to be an artist by the end of the movie. It sounds so crazy to say it's Lin-Manuel Miranda's feature directorial debut because it is so confident and assured. Um, how did each of you come to be involved with the project? Um, I was contacted in late 2019 by the producers. Um, I guess they were just interested in working with me in New York because I had worked on some other projects that they thought were appealing and related. And I spent a little time uh, chatting with Lynn and reminiscing about uh, early 90s New York and uh, what it was like then, what it's like now and how to communicate some of the time and place to people who maybe weren't around then, um, whether it was about musical theater at the time or what Jonathan Larson meant to people or um, the AIDS crisis, um, different realities of life then and trying to become a successful artist in that time. Um, and we related it on that level. And then uh, he hired me and it went from there. Of course, it got shut down with the pandemic for a while, but we, we picked back up in the fall and um, I had other commitments after a year or so. And then Myron came into the picture. Oh, interesting. So Myron, how did you come to be involved? I know you, I believe you worked with Lynn on In the Heights. My interaction was pretty limited. It was maybe a half a dozen times that I actually sat in the room with Lynn. So to get that call um, from Lynn, which is definitely a pinch me moment in my career where you're like, is this actually happening? Um, and, you know, he he pitched me the movie when he when he called me and said and I was you know I probably would have gone regardless of what the movie was but then to to hear his story you know basically saying there wasn't going to be a Lin-Manuel Miranda without Jonathan Larson and that um so I was all in um and then we moved to New York um and essentially this is before vaccines so um I was living with Lynn um for a bit and um you know living the living a very like Andy Warhol factory life of you know of you know of you know while he's writing songs for Encanto um I'm cutting um tick tick boom from him so um was, like literally living in his house wow yeah, that's where <laughs> editing was yeah <laughs> is he a morning person does he like cereal what's what's his routine <laughs> he's a 24 hour was, person that's what he is yeah, it was very nice because when he would bring me coffee, I was like, is this actually happening? <laughs> <laughs> so, Myron, you've edited a musical before. I mean, actually just this year. Um, I'm curious for each of you, had you always wanted to do a musical? And, and do you approach a musical differently than, I guess, what would be called a traditional narrative film? <laughs> it was a dream come true to work on a musical. I had put that out in the universe. Um, I've worked on a lot of musical driven projects. Um, so I just wanted to take that next step into, um, into the genre. Um, as far as the approach, uh, there's no different in the approach. Uh, you know, I treat lyrics um, like dialogue. You know, I'm choosing the best performance based on what's given to, um, to me as an editor. And so I'm picking out the kernels that it's going to tell the best story, be the best performance, um, and just try to uh, build from there. I I, um, I hadn't caught a musical feature before that I that's popping into my head, but I did work on um, a pilot for Smash 
um, several years back. Um, but um, I kind of, I don't know if I'd say pride myself, but I strive to um, diversify the kind of films that I work on. And I'm always looking for a different kind of project, not just so that I don't get pigeonholed, but also so that I'm flexing different muscles and finding new ways and access to tell stories that I think have a point of view or vision or something that, something that I connect with um, and to keep things fresh. So it was definitely exciting to be able to work on this project with somebody like Lynn. Um, and uh, the subject matter excited me because I related to so many things about it. Um, in terms of musical storytelling, it, I'm not sure that it's really different at its core than any other kind of storytelling. I mean, there are certain technical considerations and certain grammatical cons considerations or genre considerations, I guess, but it's still ultimately getting people to connect with a character and a story and emotion and all the things that, that implies. I mean, you talk about range. I, I, I think there's probably a big difference between like editing Mother and editing Darjeeling Unlimited, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they're the same movie. No, they're not the same movie, <laughs> but <laughs> it's definitely a different tone, but the energies are somewhat the same and the challenges are somewhat the same in, term of, in terms of trying to um, deliver on the details and the vision that you're going with with the filmmaker and um, striving to make it better along the way and connecting with audiences, mm -hmm. whether it's a positive connection or an emotional connection that they're making you think or whatever it is, uh, you just want people to feel it. Well, I'm a huge fan of Mother and there are parts of it that I would compare to an opera. So in a way, wow. it's got like a musical quality. Yes. Um, I'm assuming one of the differences is that there was onset music with this one, was, or maybe I'm wrong, but was it challenging to sync sound picture and music? How do, you, how do you work with the sound and music teams? The original process was, or the original idea was to do as much live vocal performance as we could. Um, and that was true for the initial part of the shoot. But then after we shut down and came back post, you know, mid pandemic, I guess, um, that wasn't really feasible because we couldn't have people belting out in a room full of other people. Um, so it switched to a lot more um, pre-records, but there were still technique to that where they would do specific takes that were live recordings so that we could have them either as reference or as options. Um, thankfully, some of the most emotional musical performances like Why and, uh, and Real Life um, were done live before the second phase of the production. So we were able to capture some essence there instead of the, uh, the lip sync performances, which have their own challenges, which you know I started to wrestle with a lot and then Myron had to keep working on them and working on them as it pushed further into post with music editors and trying to get things in sync, um, not as easy as it seems. Mm. No, it's a, it's a meticulous process where you're fudging basically thousands of edits for all the songs in the film. And so you're working very closely with your music editors and your composers to say, well, are you gonna re-record this? Are, you, uh, are we on the grid musically? Like, um, you know, if I cheat this shot, will I mess up this edit? So it's, it's a maze of madness when it comes to uh, trying to make it all feel grounded. And if anything, you know, I learned from In the Heights is that all that is very important to keep it grounded and um, keep it as real as real as possible. <laughs> um, and um, or otherwise you might take the audience out of it. So, um, you know, it's a um, yeah, it's it, it's it's a lot of work for um, to make it all feel invisible. And Switching from dialogue to playback is always kind of the big challenge that you face because, you know, people who are keyed into that can feel that right away. The sound quality changes, the, the timber changes, everything changes. So we knew in 3090, the first time that happened, as long as we got that right, that that would buy us a lot of um, confidence moving forward and being able to figure that out later in the film. I cannot tell the difference between the live and lip sync numbers. Um, and I, I don't wanna ask you to give away any secrets, but can you tell me what one of the live numbers was just so I know to go back and look? Um, why was one of them? Certainly uh, Boho Days. 
um, and real life was primarily live. Uh, I'm trying to remember which other ones have live performances to them. Um, that was kind of a mix. I know some of Come to Your Senses was done live, um, ultimately. Um, but I, th I, there might be a few others. Martin, do you remember the other ones? Uh, those are the ones that stick no, that, out. Yeah, that would cover it. Um, you know, but it's really hard to do something like therapy live where, um, and I think that was after COVID. So I think they weren't even allowed to do it. And you'd say, if you, have, you know, two people right next to each other. And, um, but it's also really challenging to make something so kinetic feel, you know, really, again, really grounded and, you know, feel like a fun vaudeville, Chicago like. Uh, number and you know not be taken out of it so the film is it's not just a musical it's a musical within a musical um, I'm curious can you can you talk a little bit about how you navigated that in discussions with Lynn like if you wanted it to all have the same tone or if you wanted to be there a slight difference in I guess what would be considered flashbacks and the present well there was a certain structural conceit to the whole thing is that you're dealing with the rock monologue um, as the framework for the whole piece. So you have your narrator built in and you have a context for the music built in where in a usual musical uh, film, you have to come up with a language or grammar or justification for breaking into song. But in this one, it starts with a musical number on stage that then bleeds into the memories of the past that we're singing about. So once that was established in 3090, which kind of sets the stage, which is always true with the musical. The first number is kind of the, is the key, the linchpin. Then it wasn't really belabored. You know, you didn't have to think so much about how the music um, was introduced and when you transitioned into a number from dialogue or dramatic moments or narrative beats. Um, it, it, part of the dynamic shape of the whole piece is that each one is a little bit different. Um, whether it's intercut with stage or on the stage alone, or in the past alone, they all have their own conceits to them um, without overstating them or overemphasizing them. I was gonna say the superbia that the, the musical within the musical was kind of the, you know, really, you know, what it was a tipping point, you know, as far as audience confusion and, um, I know Andy and Lynn at one point had you know, really tried to explain to the audience what this that musical was as well. But um, once we started screening it, it felt um, it felt like maybe we had just gone too far. So just pulling it back a degree, just telling the audience that there actually was a musical that they were workshopping and not going too down the rabbit hole um, was sort of the right line. Yeah. I really want Lynn to make suburbia now, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> you just, I was just talking the other day about that. Someday that it's going to get produced. It's got to be, see right? The well, it's going to have to in some form. I mean, people are going to be too curious about it, I think. Yeah. Um, and it's pretty fascinating, actually. The, I mean, it doesn't really have that much of a role in the film to kind of dig too deep in it, but just to kind of understand... Um, how ahead of a time he was, whether it's good or bad, I don't really know, but it, but how, um, how it predicted a lot of things about our, our lives now that seemed sci-fi at the time is pretty hilarious, actually. I don't know about you, uh, Andy, but I, I think that playing with time and, and as a, you know, a memory piece, this film is, is an editor's dream to be able to, you know, have things, you know, uh, I mean, it's also overwhelming, but <laughs> there's something about having the uh, the chance to go back and forth and um, guide the audience without them getting lost and, and them being somehow fulfilled on the other side emotionally is, uh, yeah. you know, is, is, is a lot of fun. Well, the theme of the whole movie about running out of time kind of gives you license to play with time constructs, which is kind of a, uh, an ingredient in the script, but we both kind of... I started to take it in that direction in terms of simplifying and and cross cutting, and then it kept on going further, which um, I think, you know, is all part of the simplification process. But we thankfully had a, a reasonable license to do that this time. I actually, want to talk about the structure because 
the film has Andrew Garfield, you know, giving a stage performance as Jonathan, interwoven with his autobiographical story. And you also have this real footage of Jonathan Larson um, that is, you know, just heartbreaking. Uh, how did it all work together? Was there any experimenting with moving things around? Like you seem to keep the real footage mostly to the beginning and end, but was there ever time it was incorporated more? Um, or, you know, did, you, did it stay pretty close to the initial script? That was an evolution. It wasn't really going to be a, a part of the film in any conscious way. Um, it was something where we knew that the end of the film was going to have um, an intercut between the beta cam or camcorder footage of the theater performance at the end, intercut with the past of, of the videotaping of his birthday party turning 30. And we knew that was an ingredient, but um, Alice works at DP and, and um, Lynn were smart enough to um, also videotape a lot of the other performance material on stage, particularly for the beginning of the film. Um, and Lynn and I started to talk about ways towards the end of our director's cut that we could um, introduce some more context for people from the archival that we knew that we had at our disposal to suggest to those who might not know what Jonathan, Jonathan's significance was in the theater world, what happened with rent and so on. So some of those things started to come in towards the end of the film. Um, we were experimenting with archival and stock in a number of different ways within the body of the film, um, but it made a lot of sense to us towards the end um, to set the stage of what happened to Larson after this story. Um, it was only after that where it became clear, I think Myron can talk about this, that it, it made sense to actually bookend the film with that material um, so that we start the film with this archival footage that makes Andrew as Jonathan well integrated with this other video footage that we were going to see and that it didn't feel like an attachment. You know, being inspired by the beta cam footage that was shot, you know, on stage. And then as Andy said, having these other archival sequences in the body of the film just gave us, you know, inspiration to try other kinds of archival footage. And then it, it became clear once we were screening for an audience that they wanted maybe some information about Jonathan Larson for the people who didn't know who he was or maybe some people might want information that he might have uh, passed away at an early age. And so we were just trying to find a, um, a real um, uh, graceful way of doing that. Um, and that's not so easy. You know, we were trying words on the screen, different voices. I pitched maybe Lynn should be the voiceover. It's like, it's not about me. I don't need to, I don't want to, you know, I was like, you're like Tom Hanks. Like you could say anything, right? Um, it was like, it's not about me. So then we came to Susan's voice and Susan felt like this inviting presence, you know, and it might've been confusing to use Michael's voice because um, it was another male. And, um, and then, of course, the, the actual uh, footage of Jonathan Larson at the end, um, that was such an inspiration for how Alice and Lynn had shot the film. So I think um, it, felt, it felt like a missed opportunity if we didn't show the audience that they had gotten it right and how and there would be some emotion to it. We just wanted to find a way that it didn't feel too saccharine, too biopic. Um, typical biopic uh, where you have like, you know, and, you know, the words on the screen and cut to the real person. So we're just trying to find our version of that. Is there anything that either of you have sort of picked up or adopted uh, in editing during, during the pandemic that you actually think you would use going forward? You know, they say necessity is the mother of all invention. Maybe, maybe you've learned like a, a new way of working. Maybe you like living with your director. <laughs> <laughs> well, unfortunately, I've had to do that more often than not, strangely mm -hmm. enough, with other other projects where I'm traveling with the job. Well, maybe not unfortunately, but, you know, you, you it's hard not to be um, intimate with and, and spend a lot of close time with the director as a very close, sensitive environment working on editing a film. So it's it, it's not that big of a leap to know that we would live together. Um, but in terms of the pandemic, um, 
it it had some interesting influences on this film because a lot of a lot of the discussion in pre-production or in the first phase was trying to figure out how do we communicate and represent certain things about New York City um, in 1990 that don't exist anymore and do it within a budget and kind of cheat that stuff. Um, and so it, 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 part of it was trying to dress or hide certain locations and shoot in certain places. Like how do you do Times Square? How do you do all these other things? And then when we transitioned into the, the pandemic phase, much of the material was then moved to shooting on stages. And it meant that we were basically recreating it from scratch anyway. And you didn't have to necessarily um, re completely redress or hide a location. You were, you were building your own place. Um, that, I think, worked to our advantage, strangely. Uh, but, the, but we also um, got to film in the actual theater that he uh, performed to Kick Boom in originally, which was not originally part of the plan, but it was available. Um, that's one of the things in terms of editing. I don't really know that there's, I miss being with my crews. <laughs> that's, that's a hard thing, but, but a lot of, we had such a great team that were so um, adaptive to the situation and so eager to work and, and um, you know, we found our ways to communicate. I, I may have worked in remote situations before, but obviously this is a different thing. I didn't think I could pull it off. Um, and I, you know, it was Lynn's first film. So yes, I was gonna be with him because to cut his first film remotely over Evercast or Zoom um, just didn't seem like, a, like the best way to give everything I had to that movie. But then, but still I had to do that with the rest of the crew. And I wanted the VFX to look as best as possible. And there is a lot of VFX all over the film that are, you have no idea. Um, uh, how we made New York look the way we did. And, um, but you're doing that all over like, you know, little monitors and, um, you know, meticulously working, you know, my VFX producer was in London. So we're, there's all these time differences, but, you know, just to make, just to try to get it to the finish line remotely um, at first just felt like this, um, just overwhelming task. And then suddenly everything, you know, you start to you just learn how to do it. And um, I, I think that I I'm going to love being back in the room with a lot of my crew, but I, I don't think this is going to go away. I think this will, there'll always be some version of a hybrid yeah. moving forward. And, um, you know, I get to talk to you now. Um, it, you know, we probably wouldn't even known how to do this couple. You would have to like, you know, get, you know, get in a room together, but I, <laughs> you know, I'm, you know, I'm grateful to be able to, you know, have access to people in ways that I hadn't before as well. Um, but I do think that it's kind of impossible to, uh, I've done it and I, and I know that it suffers not being able to sit in a room with the director and, um, and, you know, feel the energy together in the room about what you're looking at and getting excited together and have a creative meeting of the minds and collaboration. It's just to vibe like that over email <laughs> or Zoom or Evercast or whatever. I mean, it, you can do it, but it's tremendously challenged. Yeah. Yeah, there'll be days that, you know, Lynn would, you know, go write the next uh, amazing song <laughs> and come up <laughs> and, you know, Sit next to me, it was like, okay, what do you've got? And I'd say, it was like, well, I don't like that, but then we could talk about this and, you know, and that inspires new ideas just to have that person or Steve Levinson can come up and, um, you know, sit in the edit with us and, you know, we could pitch scenes to each other. That's really hard to do sometimes, um, you know, when you're away, you just kind of, yeah, there's an energy about that that I don't think, it's really hard to duplicate. You know? I get it. Uh, so finally, we always like to ask if someone hasn't had a chance to watch Tick, Tick, Boom yet, and I want to remind everyone it's on Netflix, you can watch it over and over again. Um, what's the first thing that sort of comes to your mind that might make someone go check it out now? Well, I think if you're an artist or any artist making anything, you're going to relate to this movie. And mm -hmm. it's going to be um, very emotional. And it's and um, yeah, I would give it a shot just based on that. And I'll even go so far as like, if you're not an artist 
and you're just trying to find your way in this world, which a lot of us are still trying to do. Um, and that it takes a lot of hard work and a lot of failure and, um, uh, and picking yourself back up. I think you'll relate to it too. So I, I would give it a shot. I mean, something I actually love about this movie is that you have characters like the best friend, Michael, who, you know, his, his dream to be a performer didn't work out and he, he's happy and he's good at what he does. And you have Scott from finance. We all need Scott from finance in our lives, you know, supporting the arts. <laughs> well, again, I want to remind everyone the movie is on Netflix. Thank you so much for to our friends at Netflix and to Myron and Andrew for talking with us today. And to everyone watching, thank you so much for joining us for this half hour with. Thank you very much. Thank you.